In this video, I'll give you my full card predictions for UFC Vegas 90. As always, you can call me Kunith. Let's make some money this week. We got middleweights in the main event. We have Brendan Allen fighting Chris Curtis under similar circumstances. It's a rematch between these two. Brendan Allen had an opponent the first time around. Opponent pulls out. Chris Curtis steps in, saves the day. Same situation here. We have Brendan Allen who was supposed to fight Marvin Vittori this week. Vittori has to pull out. Action Man steps in. In their first fight, Chris Curtis ends up knocking out Allen in the second round after a a very close round one. Both guys landed good strikes at range, but Chris Curtis caught him with a hook in the second round that led to the finish where he followed up with knees, then the TKO. Since then, their careers have gone a bit differently in the UFC, however. You have Brendan Allen, who has won six fights in a row, finishing five of those six, and he looks like one of the best fighters in the division today. While on the other side, you have Chris Curtis, who's gone three, two, and a no contest. That no contest was against Nasruddin Imovov, where he was losing that fight before the clash of heads ended that fight. So there's a good chance that he could end up being three and three right now. So clearly between the two, the younger guy's in better form, and I expect him to win this fight for a couple of reasons. Curtis is the better striker. He's the better boxer. So when they're standing there letting their hands go, I think that Brendan Allen's in way more danger than Chris Curtis is. We all know that. That's no surprise. But it's not as if Brendan Allen wasn't having success in that first fight when the fight was at range. Now on the mat, Brendan Allen is way ahead. And that's not because Chris Curtis is bad on the mat. Chris Curtis has really good takedown defense. He has good submission defense as well. But when you see Brendan Allen submitting guys like Andre Muniz and Paul Craig, undeniable, maybe the most dangerous grappler in the division. And going back to that idea, Chris Curtis does have elite takedown defense, but we saw Nasruddin Imovov go three for four on takedown attempts. He was able to get him down and get to his back more than once. Now that's Nasruddin Imovov. If Brendan Allen finds himself in the same situation, he's probably finishing the fight. And what's more is that he has five rounds to get into that position. So even if Chris Curtis does a good job of stuffing takedowns early, eventually he's going to tire, he's going to slow down, and it's going to be harder for him to keep the feet. It doesn't help that he's taking this fight on short notice. I know that Chris Curtis doesn't cut a ton of weight. He's always sparring. He's always ready for stuff like this, but this is a five round fight against a younger man, a bigger man, somebody with a ton of momentum and somebody who's coming in on a full camp. If you're Brendan Allen, you were absolutely preparing to go to war against the guy in Marvin Vittori, who you expect is going to be there for all five rounds. So you should expect Brendan Allen to come in this in great shape and have cardio to go a hard five. So even if he doesn't finish the fight, I do think that Allen is is going to win more of the minutes because Chris Curtis for as good as he is sometimes he does let minutes slip by while he's looking for his counter shots and if you've watched the channel for a while you know I love me some action man but at the same time at 36 years old you can't expect Chris Curtis to be getting any better not to say that he's bad now but you have Brendan Allen who we've only seen get better and is still only 28 years old with much more room to grow so I'm going to operate under the assumption that Allen is still getting better so give me the youth give me the man with more ways to win this fight give me the future title challenge Challenger, give me Brendan Allen to win this fight by submission. In the co-main event spot, we have Alexander Hernandez fighting Damon Jackson this week. This is a great fight to bet on. And the reason why I say that is because we know exactly what we're going to get from either of these men. And since we know exactly what we're going to get, the fight can only go a few ways. Alexander Hernandez has big power in his hands, especially early in these fights. Half of his UFC wins are round one knockouts. He can catch Damon Jackson in the opening round while Jackson's still getting into it while he's cold. And if he does, great, he probably knocks him out. And if he doesn't, then we know that Alex Hernandez is in big trouble. That's because Damon Jackson is a dog. He's a grinder. He fights at a really high pace. He looks to get guys to the mat, tries to stay heavy on top, get his jujitsu going, and that served him well in several spots in the UFC. If he can get that going against Alexander Hernandez, I think Hernandez would start to wilt under that pressure, get tired, leave openings for Damon Jackson to submit him. So if they want to line this at over under two and a half rounds, you definitely want to take the under this week. I don't think this fight sees the judges' scorecards. Now, when you look at some of these Damon Jackson Jackson losses. He lost to Billy Quarantillo in a fight where he was dominating the first round, but he looked like he gassed out a bit before losing a decision, and that's what's going to happen if you fight Billy Q. Damon Jackson showed the gap between him and Billy Q in that first round, but then he started to fade, and of course he lost the fight. But if he comes out the same way, he's going to be the fresher man later against Alex Hernandez. We've also seen Damon Jackson knocked out by Dan Ige. Happens, Dan Ige has big power. He was knocked out by Elia Tuporia. No shame in that. I like that Damon Jackson has the better gas tank. I like that he can get takedowns in this one and probably tire out Hernandez, but I think athletically he's completely outgunned here. Jackson's going to be at a huge speed disadvantage here, and Alex Hernandez has been up and down in the UFC. The 6-6 six and six record backs that up, but what nobody's going to argue is that the guy's a physical freak and a great athlete, so I see him just being a step ahead of Damon Jackson on the feet. And not for nothing, when you look at some of these Damon Jackson wins, a lot of them don't jump off the page. The pass Sabatini win is good. Rocked him early, caught him with that front kick, poured it on, got him out of 
over there in round one. But when you look at the rest, eh. He beats Dan Argueda, who was stepping in on super short notice, less than a month removed from his previous fight, making his UFC debut when it was up a weight class. Plus, Dan Argueda did way more damage in that fight. He beat Kamuela Kirk, who's struggling in the UFC a bit, beat Charles Rosa, who's no longer in the UFC, and he beat Mercer Bektik in a fight that he was getting dominated before Bektik gassed and gassed hard. So when you look at the wins, it's against smaller men, guys who haven't had a lot of success in the UFC. You have Alexander Hernandez, who was fighting at 155 not too long ago. So he's going to be bigger, stronger, faster, younger, hit way harder. And you can say that about Jackson's opponents and Jackson himself. So I like Alex Hernandez to get it done this week. I think another first round knockout is upon us. I think he surprises Damon Jackson with that long, fast right hand, catches him in the first five minutes. So the pick for this fight is Alexander Hernandez by knockout. And just as a heads up, that will be on the official betting article this week. And one thing I wanted to tell you about that we're going to start doing, I'm going to start it this week. If you go on to Kunith MMA, com and you go right to the bottom there where it says get free betting picks and tips if you fill out your information there you're going to get a prop bet for this week at juicy odds whatever the biggest prop that i like in terms of odds so let's say it's a round one submission for somebody else on the card at plus 900 or something like that that's the one i'll decide on i will send you an email with that one and a brief write-up as to why you should take it so get your free prop i'm going to do prop of the week that i will send right to your email if you've already put your email in there don't worry about it you're going to get the email but if you haven't you can go right to the website, put your email down there, and you'll be able to get that email with the prop of the week. And if you want access to the website and everything that comes along with it, you can grab a total access package that's going to give you your DFS strategy guide, lineup optimizer, data model, and projections. It's going to give you the official betting article of the week, as well as access to the community forum, and I have some plans for the community forum as well. Stay tuned. Again, all of that is on kunithmma.com. That'll be linked in the description and in a pinned comment back to the breakdown. Next, we have a fight between Morgan Charrier and Chepe Mariscal. Chepe is stepping in on short notice this week. Keep Charrier on the card in a fight that should be competitive both ways. Now, Morgan Charrier, former Cage Warriors champ, and so is Reese McKee. So take that for what it's worth. He looks to move to 2-0 this week in the UFC. He looked great in his first fight that was on that Paris card last year. Strong output, looked very sharp, threw nasty kicks to the body that folded up his opponent. Great way to make your UFC debut, and he's coming in with tons of momentum. Now, on the other side, you have Chepe Chepe Mariscal, who's got to be feeling pretty good moving to 2-0 in the UFC, coming off of back-to-back -back wins. First, he beat up on Trevor Peak, and last time out, he ends up beating Jack Jenkins via arm injury, where he held on to a tight whizzer as they were going to the ground, and then Jack Jenkins was not able to continue. For this fight, I could see Charrier doing really well with those body kicks and his movement, making it look a lot like his UFC debut because he's fighting another strong, powerful guy that's going to keep walking him down. I don't see, however, Morgan Charrier winning more minutes of this fight if it goes the distance, because because he's not a great minute winner. Most of his losses are fights that he's lost by decision or split decision. He's lost more decisions than he's won. And it's tough because Chepe Mariscal is a good minute winner, especially with that style that he has where he just stays in your face. He's uber tough. He's got cardio to go a hard three rounds and he's sneaky, one of the more experienced guys in the division. Just to name a few guys, he fought the best fisherman in all of MMA and Gregor Gillespie. He fought Bryce Mitchell, Joe Anderson Brito, Sean Soriano, Steve Garcia, all guys that fought in the UFC before getting to the UFC. So I really like the experience. I like the toughness. I like the pace and I expect him to come in with a really good game plan here because for Shadi A, he does do a lot of his best work off of those kicks. But Chepe is going to come in, crowd him so he's not able to kick him. He's going to force him to fight up against the cage, pressure him, make him uncomfortable with head position and takedown attempts. And I just see Chepe doing what he does best, making the fight dirty. And that's the kind of fight that favors him more than it does Morgan Shadi A. So give me the dog here. I will take Chepe Mariscal to win this fight by decision. Our next fight here at 155 pounds, there's not much that we need to say. You've got Ignacio Bahamondes here. He's a big favorite and he should look the part. I think he dismantles Christos Yagos this week. You got Bahamondes coming in taller, longer, younger, landing almost 3x the amount of strikes we see from Christos Yagos consistently. And of course, it's MMA, four ounce gloves, anything could happen. Sure, I get that. But I expect Ignacio Bahamondes to pick Christos Yagos apart this week and knock him out 
out sometime after the first round. And he may be live for a submission as well. Most of Yagos' losses have been by way of submission, but he's also been finished in most of his losses. So from a betting standpoint, if you want to get some action on this, of course, Ignacio Bahamandez, you can throw him in your parlays and feel good about it. I think the best way to approach this fight is taking Ignacio Bahamandez by KO or submission. That's also the pick for this one. Give me Ignacio Bahamandez. Give me La Juala to win inside the distance. Next, we have another really big favorite here with Walter Walker, brother of Johnny Walker, fighting Lucas Brezki this week. Walker making his UFC debut. Those Walker genetics, man, something else. If they could find a way to bottle that stuff up and sell it to the world's elite, the Walker family will be set for generations to come. You got Walter coming in at 6'6", 81 inch reach, freakishly athletic, very big guy, 26 years old. And frankly, this looks like a showcase kind of matchup. Lucas Brezki, 0-3 in the UFC, and one fight away from being released from the promotion. This feels a lot like Anton Turkali versus Aslan last week, where Turkali just can't find a win in the UFC. They bring in a knockout artist, they go to war, fun fight, Aslan knocks him out. It goes like according to plan, as well as it could have went for them. So it seems like we have the same situation here where Brezki is being fed to Walter Walker, being fed to Baby Walker to make sure he looks good on his UFC debut. The writing is on the wall, and I think it makes too much sense this week. Walter Walker is going to win. He probably does it early. If you want to take him by round one knockout, you're going to get a better price on him than just taking him straight up, of course. But that's also where most of the win equity is. So I'm excited to see what he looks like. Give me the youth. Give me the size. Give me the power. Give me the perfect. Walter Walker to win this fight by knockout. And real quick, if you haven't already, like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm, and share this with somebody you know who's going to be watching the fights this week. All great ways to support the channel. All good luck. Next, we have a fight between Trevor Peak and Charlie Campbell. Tell everyone. Tell the mailman. It's Trevor Peak fight week, baby. The last guy you would ever want to fight in a bathroom would be Trevor Peak. Stupid power, absurd toughness, great pressure. That's what you get from Trevor Peak, and you gotta love watching him fight. Not everything is the most technically sound, but a damn I'm sure is entertaining. In his UFC debut, he destroyed Eric Gonzalez, flatlining him in the first round. Then he ran into Chepe Marscal, who's a dog. Chepe took his best shots. He outworked him, took him down. He was able to beat him on the judges' scorecards. But even then, Trevor Peak showed crazy toughness. He was getting hit with a lot, even when he was gassed. When the fatigue sets in, you're not supposed to be able to take shots like that. But Chepe was hitting him with everything in the kitchen sink. And he was still there fighting hard for all three rounds. He wasn't looking good, but he was there. But it was nice to see him get back on track last time out over Muhammad Yaya. Now on the other side, you have Charlie Campbell, who's coming off of a knockout win in his UFC debut. And in that fight, he really could not miss against Alex Reyes, who like Trevor Peak, is one of these big, powerful guys with a lot of first round knockouts on his record. But Campbell walked him down the entire time, stayed in his face, was very busy, landed combinations, never looked to be in any danger. He even did the same thing against Chris Duncan. Chris Duncan caught him with a perfect punch, beautifully straight punch as well. And that's the thing, Trevor Peak's not going to throw a lot of straight punches. Now, of course, Charlie Charlie Campbell's going to be in trouble the entire time. He needs to be careful because Trevor Peak does have big power, but Charlie Campbell's way cleaner. Straight punches beat looping punches every time. Charlie Campbell's got those great punches down the middle while Peak tends to load up on these overhands, these hooks, these overhooks, these under jabs, whatever you want to call them because they're coming at weird angles. I see both of these guys not wasting any time, getting after it right away, letting their hands go, but because Charlie Campbell's throwing down the middle and he's got better shot selection, he's going to get home first. And for for Peak, he is super tough, but we know that he's super tough because we've seen him caught before. Defense is better than toughness, but guys who are tough tend to lean on that toughness more than they do the defense, and that's a mistake because toughness is going to wear out. Defense is there. I expect Trevor Peak to get caught by the faster, bigger, cleaner striker this week in Charlie Campbell. Peak is always going to be a popular underdog. I expect that to be the case this week, but I'm going to go with the favor here to get it done, and I think he's going to be the first man to knock out Trevor Peak. Give me Chuck Campbell, Charlie Campbell, if we want to be professional by knockout. Next, we have a fight between Court McGee and Alex Morono. This one should be a fun one between some veterans at welterweight. These guys have a combined 40 UFC fights. That's crazy longevity. To do that in the sport of MMA is absurd, but to do that in the toughest MMA promotion in the world, these guys are legends. Now, Court McGee, a throwback, an old school guy, just a tough guy who understands the game, moves well enough, and he's going to be competitive damn near every time. Court McGee in the UFC is like when you play pickup basketball ball at the gym and there's an old guy who used to hoop there but is competitive enough to keep up with the young guys maybe throws a couple dimes here and there he's not going to dunk on you but he's going to keep up Alex Morono has faced a ton of guys right on the brink of that top 15 that's pretty much where he belongs in this division and he plays that role well and both these guys are generalists they're good at everything they're not great at one thing I think that Alex Morono has better jujitsu but both these guys 
have decent boxing. They're both going to give you a hard three rounds. It just seems to me that Court McGee is getting a little bit too old. The sport's catching up to him at nearly 40 years old, competing in a sport like this, plus all of the stuff that's happened to him outside of sport. While for Morono, he's not going to be a UFC champion, but he is somebody who will always have a spot on the roster, great ambassador for martial arts overall, and he's somebody who's got a lot left in the tank. In this fight, I expect both of these guys to show a lot of respect for the other, so I think this goes the full 15 minutes because I don't think either guy is going to go out there and try to kill the other dude. I don't see either guy getting seriously hurt. I think they point fight their way to the judges' scorecards, and Alex Morono, because of his volume, because of the optics, because of his movement, is just going to do a bit more to win these rounds. Give me Alex Morono to win this fight by decision. Next, we have a fight between Norma Dumas and Tremaine Durandamy. Before we get into this one, I want you to know that I don't just read and respond to the comments. I absorb the info. I listen to the community because you guys are the best. Some other comment sections out there, disgusting, neck beards galore. But you are some good brothers in the comments out there, so I appreciate it and I wanted to say thank you, but I also say all that to say this. More than once now, some of you have commented things like, Kunith, we know that in women's MMA, the striker versus grappler rule is reversed. We take the better strikers in women's MMA, and evidence of that was last week. I should have listened when I had too much money on Aaron Blanchfield. So now we look at this matchup and we have Norma Dumas, who's probably the better grappler. We have GDR, who's definitely the better striker. I'm going with GDR to get it done, despite being old, despite being out of competition for a while. Look at the photo. That's Reebok gear that we're looking at there. So that should tell you everything you need to know. But there are a couple of reasons why I like Durand me this week. First off, this fight is at bantamweight. I don't know how Norma Dumont is going to make 135 pounds. She hasn't made that weight since 2018 and has missed weight several times since then. So who knows what this weight cut is going to be like for her. On top of that, she's starting to slide into that Carol Hosa type of role where she has the ability and can probably be doing more, but it doesn't feel like a lot's happening in her fights. It's getting a bit frustrating to watch, especially if you do back her on these things. If you're playing DraftKings or something and you see her just doing nothing, she's going to decision damn near every time. The only time in the UFC she hasn't seen the judges' scorecards is when she was slept by Megan Anderson. Megan Anderson. Meanwhile, on the other side, you have Jermaine Durandamy, who most of her wins in the UFC have been inside the distance. This is a woman who once upon a time knocked out Larissa Pacheco, who's one of the most dangerous women in MMA today, maybe the most dangerous. She knocked out Aspen Ladd with one punch, submitted Juliana Pena, and her only two losses in the UFC came to Amanda Nunes herself. GDR, while being taller and longer, still has a body that is more suitable for the weight class. She brings with her a lifetime of kickboxing experience, and even if she's taken down, she's going to be looking for submissions. This looks like the kind of fight that Dumont will let slip through her fingers, even if that happens. She might not make weight and actually compete, so I expect the weight cut to take a lot out of her, and I see GDR just stunning her at some point. I think she's going to be really surprised by the hand speed, by the length of these punches, by the accuracy, because all of that translates to power. So I'm interested to see what the KO props for GDR are this week, and that will be the pick for this one. I think Jermaine Durandamy wins by knockout. Next, we're looking at a fight between Cynthia Calvillo and Pieta Rodriguez. I quite like Pieta Rodriguez because of the striking, because of the wrestling, toughness. She's got good cardio and she had that beautiful O in her record taken away last time out. She lost by submission to Jillian Robertson via armbar in a situation where she never tapped. You could say what you want about the stoppage. You could make an argument, well, she verbally tapped because she screamed, but she didn't tap. Her arm didn't break and she immediately protested the stoppage. Either way, whatever the case may be, what's done is done. Hopefully she learns from that. But as far as this fight goes, do I think that Piero Rodriguez gets caught with an armbar this week? No chance. It's hard to back Cynthia Calvillo nowadays because she is 36 years old, she has won one fight in her last seven, and she's going to have to fight at a pace that she probably struggles to maintain. Piero Rodriguez is aggressive, she's going to move forward, stay busy, she's going to put Calvillo on her back as well. That's all going to force her to work, and I don't see Calvillo keeping up with that pace. There are going to be situations where she's taken down, and I think late in the second round and all through the third round, she's just going to accept a bottom position, and we're going to see Piero Rodriguez glide to a decision win. I don't see Calvillo losing by submission she never has before. Rodriguez isn't looking for a whole lot of submissions in the UFC, but I do think that we're going to get a little bit of a lay and pray kind of situation for 15 minutes, unfortunately. Lots of wrestling in this one, but I think the younger, stronger athlete is just going to outwork Cynthia Calvillo, giving Pieta Rodriguez to win this fight by decision. Next, we're looking at a fight between Dan Argueda and Gene Matsumoto. I think that Dan Argueda is going to teach the young man a lesson here. I feel this is a good buy low spot for Dan Argueda coming off of that loss 
lost to Miles Johns. It was turned into a no contest, but he lost basically every round of that fight because Miles Johns was able to just do a bit more. But I think that he's going to give this young guy a lot of trouble. Matsumoto has had a lot of fights, very well rounded. Somebody who's coming in with a lot of momentum, picked up the win on Contender Series. Even when he was taken down in that fight, he was getting right back up. But I think that Dan Arguet is a much stronger grappler than Tanner is. We saw Arguet survive some tough spots against Damon Jackson. Again, I felt like he did more damage in that fight than Jackson did. And personally, I just value the experience over higher level competition. I value the experience of the gym that he's in, the competition that he's faced with each and every day that he's in training. And when you see somebody like Matsumoto come into the UFC undefeated, you normally think these guys are finishing fights left and right. He's winning by decision a lot, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's going to be tough for him to win minutes over Dan Argueda if he's doing a lot of that from a defensive position. If he's defending takedowns, if he's trying to work back to his feet, if Dan Arguetta can get to his back at some point. So I think there's a lot of value on the underdog. I'll take the UFC experience, the grappling, and the get right spot for Dan Arguetta this week. Give me Dan Arguetta to win this fight by decision. Next, we're looking at a fight between Dylan Budka and Cesar Almeida. I feel like the consensus is going to be that Cesar Almeida goes in there and knocks him out, and I would understand why. Super high level kickboxing experience has shared the ring with some of the best kickboxers of all time, and Dylan Budka has not seen a striker of this caliber in his short MMA career. But a couple of things jump off the page to me. Dylan Budka has more MMA experience. Dylan Budka's 12 years younger, and it's not like he's 12 years younger where he is 18 years old or something. He's 24 years old. He is somebody who is a collegiate wrestler out of Notre Dame, so he's got high-level wrestling experience, and he's fighting a kickboxer. So what happens when a wrestler fights a kickboxer? Where more often than not, the wrestler is going to get the better of it. I think the younger man is going to be able to push a heavier pace as well. Let's say he gets Cesar Almeida down, he's probably going to be able to keep him there. And if he doesn't keep him there, he starts rematting him, rematting him, rematting him at 36 years old. I'm not expecting that gas tank to hold up. Now at range, I think if they spend more than 90 seconds at a time with Budka not pressing him up against the cage at the very least, I think Cesar Almeida is going to start touching him up pretty bad. I think he's going to chop that front lead leg down harder than Budka's ever seen before. I think he's going to touch him up with the hands as well. To me, I feel like it's going to come down to how hard Budka decides to crash the pocket and if he really commits to the wrestling heavy approach. Because if he does, I think he has a lot of success here, just like he did on Contender Series. Time will tell. That's a very tricky one either way. I could see it going either way and looking dominant for whoever wins. So if you say Cesar Almeida wins and he loses, you're going to look like a joke because it's not going to look competitive. But the same thing could be said for Budka. But I will take Budka to win this fight because I like that he's younger. I think that he's going to overwhelm him with his strength and his presence and his pace. He should be able to get takedowns here, and I think the takedowns are going to come easier and easier as the fight goes on. So give me Dylan Budka to win this fight by decision. And lastly, we have a fight here, women's MMA, striker versus grappler. We talked about this earlier. Which way do we go? Well, we're supposed to go with the striker, which in this case would be Nora Coronal. She's the better striker. She's also more one-dimensional. Melissa Mullins is the better grappler here. But does the rule get violated when you were taken down by Jocelyn Edwards five times and essentially gifted a decision because you're fighting in Paris? I don't know. It's pretty shaky for me. When they were on the feet and at distance, she looked a lot better. And Jocelyn Edwards is not a bad MMA striker by any stretch of the imagination. So I think that Coronal is the much better striker here. But if she gets put down her back, if she gets taken down, Melissa Mullins is really good in top position. So this one's very tough for me. But in terms of process, we're not going to make the mistake, right? We talked about this earlier. It is important for us to learn from our mistakes. Now, there aren't going to be hard and fast rules that work every time for the stuff that we're doing, of course. But if we want to remain consistent with what we were talking about before, striker versus grappler and women's MMA, it's inverted. So I'll take Nora Coronal to land the harder strikes, to get the better of the striking exchanges, and to win rounds as a result of just having bigger moments. And who knows, getting taken down by Jocelyn Edwards in that first fight five times while it's embarrassing, it's also a good learning experience overall. She knows what it's like to be taken down, what it's like to fight through that adversity, and she got the win anyway. Do I agree with it? Not really. But if that's how we're going to judge these fights, I think that that favors her style. So she's going to do a better job of keeping the feet this week, hopefully. She's going to get the better of the striking exchanges. I expect Nora Coronal to win this fight by decision. If you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Again, like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm, and I'll see you later in the week for final picks. Let's go.